hero is often defined as someone who is running towards danger as others are running away from danger. Uh, one story that I heard recently, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I listened to several versions of this story, and there's a lot of folklore around it, and it's coming out of the former Soviet Union, so none of it's probably true, all right? So uh, this is a story that happened uh, at Chernobyl, and Chernobyl was a nuclear, uh, react, a nuclear site in uh, Ukraine. Matter of fact, Kyle Hancock and, and Brian and I have been right outside of uh, Chernobyl back when they were in ninth grade on a mission trip. We did ministry not too far from there. And uh, this nuclear act actor, I think it was 1986 or 1987, um, one of them catches on fire and it's having a nuclear uh, reactor meltdown. And there's other reactors there. And as this thing, as this nuclear reactor is melting down and everything's on fire, there's this great worry because there is this massive tank of water under this reactor that's like five million gallons. And the worry becomes that if the fire reaches that water, then it's going to basically cause like uh, this crock pot thing to kind of happen, not a crock pot, but a pressure cooker thing to kind of happen, and the others would blow up. Chernobyl, um, about 50 people died, again, this is Soviet Union number, so who knows what's true, but about 50 people died there at it, and about another 4,000 in the coming days as a result of it. They say that if all three of these nuclear reactors would have re um, exploded, that it, it would have knocked Ukraine and other countries off the map, that like a quarter of Europe would have been what is now just Chernobyl, that's a small town that had about 14,000 people in it that, that's no longer able to, to function. You, can't, you, can, you can go there briefly, but you can't, no one can live there. And so as this thing is melting down, what they realize is that there is a valve, and if this valve is turned, it will drain this 5 million gallon tank, and it will save tons and tons of people. And so firefighters tried to figure out how to drain it, but they couldn't. And so then a couple of engineers in the plant, I think it was two engineers and a supervisor in the plant, realized, okay, where we have to go and what we have to do will save a lot of people, but it will cost us our lives. And so you know what they did, right? It's two engineers and a supervisor, right? Don't, don't, two engineers and supervisors normally get the everyday hero status, right? No, right? That's the firefighters that get the everyday hero status. But these men, in a lot of ways, they're known as the Chernobyl Suicide Squad, uh, were considered to be heroes. And, man, there's a lot of folklore about how this happened. Some say they had to, like, swim underground. Others say they had to wade through waist-deep water. Who knows what's the truth, but we know that they found this valve, and they turned this valve, and they were able to drain it. But what happened was these men, again, the folklore says that these men, uh, because they were exposed to the radioactive nuclear uh, material, that they died this long, slow, painful death. That's the legend. That's the legend of the Chernobyl Suicide Squad. Well, this week in this text, we're going to see Paul... Running to a slow, long, painful death. We're going to see the Apostle Paul headed into danger. I think if we called Apostle Paul a hero to his face, what he said in return might not be, uh, it would be putting us in our place. I don't think he would like to be called a hero, but when we look at the book of Acts, we see that Paul was in fact a hero for Christ. I remind us what he said just last week in our text to the Ephesian elders in the church. He said this in Acts 20, verse 22. He says, and now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. And here's this powerful line. But I do not account my life of any value 
nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. A good friend will talk you out of a suicide mission. A good friend will hear what you're going to go do, and they'll realize the folly in it, and they'll try to talk you out of it. And this happened for Paul. This is what happens in the text between those two texts. And I'm going to talk about it in my devotion this week, of uh, what a good friend will do. A good friend will try to talk you out of it. A good friend pulls off Paul's belt, and he ties himself up and says, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to you. But a better friend will talk you into being obedient to Jesus. Man, obedience to Jesus is what's best, no matter the cost. This is Paul's life, this is his testimony, and this is his ministry, and this is what we're going to see here today. A life lived in obedience to Jesus is worth it. I look forward to sharing that devotion. It'll come out this Wednesday on the trail. Um, You can hear it there. Here's the main thing that I want us to see today, and this is our first point as we approach our text. And our text today uh, starts in Acts 21, verse 17, and we're going to work down to 22, 2, but I'm going to explain a little farther than that. Here's the first thing I want you to see. This is what Paul was doing. Paul was glorifying God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. Paul was glorifying God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. Verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to Jesus, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. So Paul... Uh, As he heads into Jerusalem, man, at this point it's been years since he's been in Jerusalem. Remember, uh, from the start of his ministry to the the Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15 was quite some time, probably like 13 years. And now if we just start adding up the number of years he spent on his first and second, and now on his third missionary journey, it's been a minute, right? So he's got to, the brothers greet him, and man, there are brothers there who love them, and I'm sure that there there were hugs and there was much affection But it goes straight to the next day, and it says the next day uh, that he went uh, with James and the elders were present. So he goes with James. This is James, Jesus' half-brother. He is the leader of the Jerusalem church. In many ways, he's um, the leader of all Messianic believers, all of the Jewish people who had come to faith in Christ. This was their guy. James, And so he's with the elders. Some say that uh, th- it's probable that this, this amount of elders was like 70 people. Uh, they thought that they probably modeled these elders in Jerusalem after the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin had 70. And so they say, okay, there's probably uh, about 70 men present. And after greeting them, it says he related to them one by one the things that God had done. And so one by one, I mean, he starts talking about the conversion of Lydia. And he tells the, the story of healing the slave girl. And he healed her, and their masters got mad, and they ended up in prison. And you know what happened when they were in prison? Like, the Lord broke them out of the joint. And you remember what happened then? That the Philippian jailer got saved. Not just him, but him and his whole household, right? And he, he tells about how he marches into Athens. And he says those incredible lines, remember this, men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious, for as I passed along, I observed the objects of your worship. I found an altar with this inscription. Do you remember this? This was an epic moment. There at Areopagus. Oh, to the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. You know the elders had to be like, going, oh, that was a good line. Like he nailed that one. He goes on and he begins talking. He probably tells about our boy Eutychus fell asleep, fell out of the third story, in which he raises Eutychus uh, from the dead. I'm sure he told about uh, the work he did at Corinth and the work he did at Ephesus and 
man, the seven sons of Siva and how they got him in trouble um, and how it, the whole thing went down with, with them. I'm sure that in all of this, he proclaimed the good news that the gospel was proclaimed and the Gentiles, the unclean, were made clean. The unholy were made holy. The sinners were made saints. The demon possessed saved. The, the dead raised. The, the ones who couldn't walk were made to be able to walk. He tells of them the good news that Jesus died for the Gentile too. This is what happens when you proclaim the gospel. Good news is what happens when you proclaim the gospel. When you proclaim the gospel, you have good news to tell. And so here's what happens. James and the elders had a reaction. It says they glorified God. They glorified God. That means that, that they weren't necessarily envious. They weren't jealous, but they were happy. And happy in that moment to say... May God be glorified. That's what was there. And so I want to point out two things real quick that I think are very applicable uh, to our little congregation here. And that's the first, our mission statement. Our mission statement is simply this. We glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. And here is an example of what that is. We glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. This is what he was doing. This is what the church is called to do. This was Paul's ministry, and this is what we do. We, we glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. That is the good news, that while we were yet sinners, that while we were unclean, God loved us enough to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He loved us that much, that he would send his own son to die for us, and that those who believe in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection will be saved. Just as he saved all these people, that's the good news. And that's part of our mission as a church. And here's the second thing. When someone else or another church is preaching the gospel and God is going before them and God is saving people, we as a church should absolutely celebrate. And man, it becomes really quick that churches can be in competition and when something good is happening at another church, that other churches tend to want to quench that for some reason. Because they want to be the church that's growing. They want to be the, the, the church that it's happening at. And man, we should not do that. that the, the temptation there is to be envious or to covet what is God is going before them and doing. But we should celebrate. We should absolutely celebrate when the gospel is being proclaimed and people are hearing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and God is calling them unto himself and they are believing the gospel. They are being saved. Lives are being changed. We ought to celebrate. So, what is our point and what is our existence? Why are we here? We exist to glorify God by proclaiming Jesus Christ just like Paul did. But here comes the next big truth that we're going to see in this text, that the proclamation of the gospel will be met with adversity. The proclamation of the gospel will be met with adversity. Continuing our text, and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? They're all zealous for the law. They've been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. And so here the elders, are J uh, James 1, they, pre they present this and they say, You see, brother, we have many thousands who've come to faith too here in Jerusalem. But they are still zealous for the law. And they're hearing that what you're teaching is against the law. And do you know the biggest problem with their accusation? It's a bold-faced lie. Their accusation isn't true. 
This was all settled in Acts chapter 15 in the Jerusalem Council, the last time Paul was there. Paul, Paul said some really powerful things. I'm, I'm going to read some of them here in a minute. Um, but Paul wasn't teaching against the law. Paul was teaching the fulfillment of the law. That's, that's what we, we read earlier, right? This is, this is a lie. What's being said isn't true of Paul. It isn't true of his ministry to the Gentiles. I, I read of one story this week that, that, a, that a woman had gone and this woman, she was, she was in, the, in, the, in the ancient east and she had um, heard a lie, but she didn't know it to be a lie. And so she went and she started telling people this lie. She told it and she told it and the lie began to spread. And then she found out she was guilty of spreading a lie. And so this lady went to uh, a, a man that she considered wise in her village, and she said to the man, she said, I've, I've unknowingly spread this lie, and it isn't true, and I've, I've somewhat caused an uproar, and I regret it, and I want to get it back. I, I want to get that lie back in. I want to stop the damage that's being happened because I told this lie. And he said, okay, go to the market. In the center of the village, go to the market and get a chicken dead chicken and take it home and cook it but on your way home take and pluck the feathers of the chicken and just drop them throughout the village on the way home he said after you cook the chicken bring me some of the meat from there and so she does she does exactly what he says she gets the chicken she plucks it throughout the village and she brings in the meat and the wise man said now I'll eat the meat you go back and you collect all the feathers throughout the village comes back a couple hours later and she says I only found three he said that's just like your lie you're never going to be able to get it all back in you're never going to be able to constrain the lie once it's told and here's what's happened I don't know who started the lie I, I, I don't know who had lied about Paul but by the time it got back as lies do as gossip does it spreads and it changes and it causes damage their accusations weren't true and man, we're talking about Pharisees here. We're talking about converted Pharisees, but they were Pharisees nonetheless. And here's the truth. We like to believe lies. We love to believe lies that make us feel better about ourselves. The Pharisaical nature of our hearts, much like theirs, is very quick to believe the worst about somebody else. But yet we want people to think the best about us. And so this is what happens to Paul. The, the, these, these Pharisees weren't far from their, uh, their, their, their Pharisaical roots. And they are holding tight in their traditions. And to be honest, it's legalism. The, the Jerusalem church, I think, in a lot of ways, I mean, I think there were a lot of snakes in the grass. I think there were um, a, a, a lot of people there who were holding to tradition for salvation rather than grace alone. And so Paul was greatly slandered. Now, Paul was in good company. John 15, Jesus says this. He says, remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than... Than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And if they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. And so, can I remind you of something? Is it the very same lies were said about Jesus? Listen to this. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what this is what I had Josh read because, man, I think this is. This, in, in our hearts, is very important as we try to grasp in, in American church of doing the right things and fulfilling the right rules and obeying the right things, and we, we are good and, and find good favor with God that way. But this is what Jesus said. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. 
Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same thing will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of one of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so, man, Jesus, when, even when he was accused, had a response. It wasn't one total condemnation. It was always one of grace. One of unmerited favor. And here's the next truth I want us to see in this text is that the gospel is about grace. The gospel is about grace. Verse 23, do therefore what we tell you. This is, this is James's solution to the, the men of the Jerusalem church believing lies about him. It's, hey, we're going to prove them, prove to them that these lies aren't true, right? Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who under a vow, are under a vow. This would have been a Nazarene vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses. Every commentator I read said this would have been quite expensive. So they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and, what ha- and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. All the way back in Acts chapter 15. Then Paul took them in, and the next day he purified himself along with them, and he went into the temple, giving notice when the days of pur- purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. And so here's what I want us to see is that the gospel is about grace. The answer to legalism isn't more legalism. The answer to legalism is grace. I, I read this text and my response is wrong. I read this text and listen, some people say that Paul, Paul sinned by, by following through with what James asked them. Some people are like, no, Paul, this just shows you Paul's infallibility. Well, of course Paul is infallible. He said he was. Right? He never claimed he was anything else. But they're saying, no, this was Paul's sin, and he shouldn't have done this. You know what? I feel that way, too. I feel like, Paul, you have done everything right. You have preached the gospel. You have put your life um, in harm's way. You handled the Jerusalem church beautifully in Acts chapter 15. The next chapter in 16, you, you have Timothy be circumcised to like further the ministry. And you've made this whole thing about circumcision. You read what he writes to the church at Galatia later on, and you're like, Paul, why are you settling and going to the traditions of man rather than the doctrines of God? This is not what Paul does. Paul doesn't have my heart. He doesn't answer legalism with a different form of legalism. He answers legalism with grace. You know who he gets this from? Jesus again. Matthew chapter 5, back in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this. He said, you've heard that it was said. This is verse 38 of chapter 5. Uh, you've heard it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. This is what we call often second mile Christianity. This is, this is the way of Jesus. This is Jesus' way, second mile Christianity. This is humility on display. This is what it means to count yourself more significant than others. Paul, who had already been through, by the way, the full 30-day Nazarite cleansing process before in his life. He had already done things. He had, he had dotted every I. He had crossed every T. And people had lied and, and, and told things about him. And yet this is his, his way. This is his response. It's one of grace. It's, it's one of, of no, I'm, I'm going to count you more significant than yourself. Myself. I'm, I'm going to count you more important than me. And so, yeah, this is probably futile. This probably isn't going to work, but you, James, who I, I love and care for, and you, 
the elders of the church in Jerusalem, out of respect for you, I'm going to do this. This is second mile Christianity. This is, this is what Christians are called to. That, that when life is, is made hard by others, that when you're slapped on the right cheek, you turn the left and offer it to. When the, 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 the law was that a Roman soldier could require that you would tote their gear one mile. And, and Jesus' response was, don't just tote it one mile, tote it, tote it two. Go above and beyond what we're called and ask to do. This isn't just about being kind and loving. This is about living life on mission and winning people to Jesus. That's what this is about. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, we, we've talked about this passage already. He would have written this probably in Ephesus, and he's already been in Ephesus, so this letter is already written, so this is his own advice. For though I am free from all, I've made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To the, those under the law, I became as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I may win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. That I might win the weak. I've become all things. This is this is the line right here. I've become all things to all people. By um, by all means, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Here's the next thing I want you to see: is that proclaiming the gospel is for God's glory. This is, this is not for man's glory. This is not Paul proclaiming the gospel for his own glory. He's doing this is for God's glory. Proclaiming the gospel is for God's glory. Verse 27, when seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid, laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled the holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Also a lie. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. And as, the temple were, and as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. So he at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. The prophecy of his, his friend now fulfilled. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. And so, there's no other reason to do this if you're Paul. Except for God's glory. This was a lose-lose situation. This was the suicide mission. He knew. His testimony was, I'm going to Jerusalem uh, constrained by the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be unbound. I realize that chains and imprisonment await me. And man, the very thing he thought was going to happen is happening. And the people have turned on him. The lies have been spread. Even though he showed him grace, they were going to show him justice. Of course, it was a justice he didn't deserve. It was a, it was a, uh, a mob justice with a mob mentality. And it was going to cost him his life. Had the Roman government not interfered to, to, to God using the government in his sovereign plan. Here's the next thing I want you to see, though. Is that, yeah, the gospel's for God's glory, yes. It's also our only defense. The gospel's our only defense. The gospel is the answer. It's the answer to the hope that we have. Verse 37, as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the uh, assassins out in the wilderness? 
again a lie? Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, after had just been beaten by this people, motioned with his hands to the people, and when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. This is showing them that he was, in fact, a good Jew. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And so did you catch that? Brothers and fathers, here's the defense that I now make before you. He had accusations hurled at them. In a lot of places, Paul and his ministry was on the offense. He was taking the gospel forward. But in this moment, he finds himself having to play defense. And this is what he begins to do. He begins to share his, his testimony, his story of, of his heritage and his lineage and that he was a Jew and he was born in uh, Tarsus and he was brought up at the feet of Gamil. And, and, he, and he begins to tell about the strict manner of the law and, and how he held it and that he began, even in his ministry, to be people, a, a man who was a great persecutor of, the, of Christians, of the way. That he even brought them to death. That he was there when Stephen was stoned. He was there for the, the first martyr and that he was a really, really good at it. But then he goes on to tell the story of how he was heading to Damascus. Going to persecute more Christians and behold, he sees a great light. And basically, we sum this up, we've already preached this text. Jesus appears to him and Jesus calls Paul to himself and he saves them. He shares with them the hope of the gospel. The only answer is the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners, which he said he was the chief. That Jesus Christ came to save. And he begins to tell of his radical life transformation and how God saved him. That was his defense. That was his answer. So he goes on a suicide mission. His message and his, his goal and his mission is to proclaim Christ in Jerusalem. And when it comes time for him to defend himself, do you know what he does? He proclaims Christ in Jerusalem. Paul is obedient. And here's what I'm going to tell you today as we look at this suicide mission. This is what it is like to live the Christian life because here's the truth. We don't live for this life, but for the next life. This life is one that is lived to proclaim the goodness of Christ, the goodness of God. And here's what I would tell you in your life. That today, that if you've not accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if, if, if you've never done what Paul did on the road to Damascus, that maybe is the day that God is calling you to believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. This is the truth. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the, the free gift of salvation comes through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says, uh, Paul says in Romans, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised his son from the dead, you will be saved. So today I would tell you, if you don't know Christ, we, we come up here in a second and we sing a, a song of response. Cry out in prayer. And pray to God in faith. Ask God to save you today and he will. And man, for, for those who are Christians in the room... To ask you to live what Paul said in Romans to chapter 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Live that way. Live as if you're Paul on the way to his eventual death in Rome. Live like Jerusalem is the stop that's going to get you in trouble. Become all things to all men that you might win some. Live by grace through faith in Jesus that he will accomplish his purposes through you.
and he will receive the glory. As a church, let's be a church that glorifies God by proclaiming Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. It is a gift. Your word is true. Lord, let us not be people who hear your word. And it's like we, we look in the mirror and go away and forget what we look like. Like James talked about. That we would we'd be people who remember the gospel. That, that the gospel would rule our lives. That we would be people who gather around your word and hear your word. And that it would impact our life and change our life. That we wouldn't forget it. That we would not be hearers only, but doers also. Lord, we've got pieces in of our, our, our heart that are legalistic. And we're holding on to rules and... And, and we're being judgmental, and we're, we're quick to look to other people. God, would you help us to repent of that today and to look to you? Would you help us to see our own sin and repent of it and run to you today? Lord, let us live a life full of grace, full of unmerited favor, God, and give us a boldness to share um, that good, the good news of the gospel with others. Lord, we love you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name.